So I am Mindy Sidner, the Senior Medical Science Liaison with Cooper Surgical, and we are hosting today's webinar in collaboration with the American Neurogynecologic Society. I'm very excited to have Natalie Weigand as our speaker for today. So I am Mindy Sidner, and to learn more about the basics of using pessaries with pelvic organ prolapse issues in our patients. Natalie is a certified family nurse practitioner working in the Women's Health Institute at Cleveland Clinic. She specializes in neurogynecologic and pelvic floor disorders and also works in the Center for LGBTQ Care. Natalie obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from Ohio University and her Master's Degree in Nursing at Walsh University in Canton, Ohio. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you, Mindy. I'm so happy to be here and excited to be discussing Pessary Basics today in partnership with Cooper Surgical and the American Neurogynecologic Society. So before we get started, my only disclosure is that I work with Cooper Surgical as a speaker. So to start, I think it's important to first understand what exactly is prolapse and how to identify it. Without this basic knowledge, it's going to be challenging for any practitioner to confidently manage prolapse, including the use of a pessary device, which we are going to be discussing later in this, dis this discussion. So by definition, prolapse is the herniation of the pelvic organs to or beyond the vaginal walls. The varying sites or types of prolapse are listed here. And it's important to acknowledge that these sites are not necessarily exclusive of the others. And a patient can have one or a combination of any of these sites. Bowel and bladder dysfunction, pelvic discomfort in the form of pressure or a sensation of a bulge, and inability to be sexually active are some of the most common symptoms of prolapse. And as many of you likely know, if you've been in practice for even a short period, is that this can have a significantly negative impact on a woman's body image, functioning, and overall quality of life. Lastly, as you continue to see more patients presenting with these complaints in clinic, there's a good chance you'll be met with a patient who A, feels relieved by having a better understanding of what's really going on with her body, and at the same time, also feels frustrated by not really knowing how this even happened to her in the first place. I think it's important to acknowledge patients' frustrations when their bodies are changing and they feel out of control, and also counsel patients that there isn't just one specific reason or answer to these changes. When I see a patient for an initial consult or pessary teaching and take the time to review these risk factors listed on the slide here, more often times than not do I see the light bulb go off in their head when many realize that more than one of these apply to them. So the takeaway is that there is no one reason why. It can be one, a combination, or all of these for any given patient. And not having the exact answer is actually okay. I try to reassure patients that they're in the right place to have it addressed so that they can start to feel better. And that's usually enough for them. Okay, so next we're going to discuss pelvic organ prolapse prevalence. When I first started in my practice as an APP in urogynecology, I was really surprised to find how common pelvic floor disorders are. Call me naive or ignorant or just unaware, but I had no idea until I worked in this subspecialty that you can see here on the slide that one in five women suffer from one or more pelvic floor disorder. That's 20% of women. And in less than 10 years, it's projected that the population of women who are 65 or older will double, which in turn increases the number of women who are at risk for having pelvic organ prolapse. To note, pelvic floor disorders accounted for $300 million in cost in the US in 2010. I can only imagine how much that has increased over the past decade and with our current inflation rate. What's promising and I think really important to acknowledge, though, is that the data shows that pessary use can significantly improve quality of life and functioning 
and as a result, yields a high satisfaction rate among those who use pessary devices to manage their prolapse. This is a little bit of an older study, but in 2004, 92% of women were happy with their pessary after only two months of use, and nearly all of their prolapse symptoms had resolved. How amazing is it that we as medical providers have this simple tool that allows us to really help our patients? So in terms of stages of prolapse, there are four total, and they are defined on this slide. They range from stage one, which is the most mild form of prolapse, and is defined by the most distal portion of the prolapse being greater than one centimeter above the hymenal ring. Stage two and three are as follows. And then lastly, there's stage four, which is complete eversion of the total length of the lower genital tract. This can also be referred to by many providers as complete prosodentia. On the right-hand side of this slide, there's a really nice diagram on the American Urogynecologic Society website that shows all of the POPQ or pelvic organ prolapse quantification system measuring points that one should familiarize him or herself with in order to be confident and competent in identifying and diagnosing prolapse stages. You can find this guide on the OGS website and you can even input what you would likely see in clinic as in terms of different measurements to visualize when you're performing your pelvic exam, which I think is especially helpful for newer practitioners who are just getting started and might not feel very confident or comfortable with the POPQ measuring system. And you can practice just on the computer on the OGS website using this tool, which I think can be really helpful and applicable in your own practice. So now that we've identified prolapse, we can move on to the next important question, which is what in the world is a pessary? And as many of us already know, if you've been in practice for even a short period of time, is that a pessary is a prosthetic device that's inserted into the vagina And it's most commonly used in the treatment of either stress urinary incontinence to support pelvic organ prolapse or a combination of both of these things. Historically, pessaries have been reserved for patients who wish to defer surgical repair or those who are not candidates for surgery due to medical comorbidities. The majority of pessaries are made of plastic or silicone. There are many, many reported varying sizes and types of pessaries. However, generally, it is agreed that there are around six to nine primary devices that are commonly used. In my practice, we mostly use the ring, ring with support, gellhorn, donut, and cube pessary. The unique and sometimes challenging thing about pessary use is that while there are some general common guidelines, overall the use of pessaries in the management of prolapse vary greatly from clinician to clinician. I would encourage those of you who are new to pessaries to shadow other providers as much as you can in clinic. It's good to see how each provider may have his or her own process or style to fitting a pessary. So the American Urogynecologic Society developed this list of top 10 things physicians and patients should question worksheet in 2020, which specifically mentions the use of pessary devices and how this should not be excluded as an option for the management of prolapse. I know in my practice, many physicians will counsel patients on both surgical intervention and conservative measures such as a pessary and will fit patients with a pessary at their consult and have them think about their treatment options after they go home. A lot of times patients will come back for their pessary follow-up a few weeks later to see me and decide that they would prefer a pessary over surgery anyway. So I think the takeaway point here is just that this is a great option for a lot of patients. And based on the data I reviewed previously, pessaries yield a high satisfaction rate while also deferring invasive interventions that a patient may wish to avoid at that time for one reason or another. So let's move on to the part a lot of you have been waiting for, which is how in the world do I know what pessary is the right one for my patient? This served as a source of anxiety for me as a new APP, but I assure you, 
It's like any new thing you learn with practice comes more confidence and soon enough, you'll be an expert to helping so many women feel better. Choosing the right pessary can be tricky at times because getting the right fit is dependent on so many varying factors. One thing I started to tell my patients when I wasn't super savvy in the pessary fitting skills yet is that fitting for a pessary is kind of like trying on a shoe. Sometimes you get it right on the first try. Other times you have to try on a few before you get it right. But like all feet, all other parts of the body come in differing shapes and sizes. And that's okay too. And funny enough, I'll let you in on a secret. I still tell my patients that exact thing, even with four years of experience with pessaries under my belt. One thing that choosing a pessary is heavily dependent on is a patient's anatomy. Some women have a small intritus and a larger vaginal caliber or vice versa. Some women have a large intritus and a short vaginal canal, which limits what size pessary you can use because the larger the pessary, the more space it takes up in the vagina. And that's something to consider when you're fitting your patient. Another factor is the integrity of the vaginal epithelium. You should be asking yourself, does this patient have atrophy and how severe is it? Is this going to impact my patient's outcome? Does this raise concern for vaginal erosions down the road if a pessary is used for a long period of time? How high is that risk? And am I willing to still fit the patient with a pessary? Do I think that the benefit of the pessary outweighs the risk of an erosion? Another thing to think about is the extent of the prolapse. So do you need a stronger pessary? Do you need maybe a ring with support instead of a ring? Or do you need a gellhorn? Those are all things with experience you'll become more comfortable with, but questions you should always ask yourself when fitting a patient. Another question is, what are the patient's goals in terms of pessary use? What does her lifestyle look like? Is she sexually active? What are her personal goals for the pessary? These things will drive your selection in the type of pessary if the patient wishes to just be able to insert it during physical activity. Let's say she likes to play tennis or golf or go on long hikes. Maybe she only wants to wear the pessary during those activities. That's totally fine if that's what she wants to do. And that's just a, a discussion that you have with the patient at the time of her fitting. Another thing to think about is how intact is the patient's dexterity? Does she have arthritis or another condition that would impact her ability to remove the pessary and reinsert it? As you know, a lot of older patients suffer from prolapse, not to say that younger patients don't, but our patient population is a little bit older um, and they might struggle with their fine motor coordination. And that's something to think about. What other physical limitations does she have, if any, that would preclude her from being able to manage the pessary at home? Does the patient require skilled nursing care? And is it appropriate for her caregivers to help manage the pessary device for her? Does her cognitive status affect her ability to understand that she even has a pessary and that she needs help from her caregivers in her home or in a facility? What are your thoughts on her going back to her nursing home with no one to monitor the pessary other than you in the office? Just because someone lives in a skilled nursing facility doesn't mean that the staff there is going to feel comfortable managing it. And these are things you need to think about when you're sending a patient back to that home with the pessary in, in place. And, you know, think about will this have a potential negative impact that kind of outweighs the use of the pessary or is it not really an issue? These are all things that you should consider when you're thinking about a pessary for a patient and can help guide your choice in the type of pessary and also in what their follow-up should look like after you insert the pessary. Some patients you may want to see more frequently and others you can kind of push it out a little bit further. All of it is about setting them up for successful outcomes and improving their quality of life. And that can look different for different patients. So now we're going to talk about support versus space filling devices. Both support and space filling devices are held in place in the following ways. So they're held in place by proximately by the uterus or the vaginal apex if someone has had a, a hysterectomy. 
laterally by the levator muscles and distally by the cubic bone and the vaginal introitus. For support pessaries, this is generally reserved for patients who have less extensive prolapse. And for the space filling, this is for people who have more severe prolapse, such as in stage three and stage four prolapse. For more extensive prolapse, um, vaginal capacity can also increase significantly due to levator atrophy. So this is another thing to think about when you're choosing a space filling versus a support pessary. And an enlarged vaginal choice can cause a support pessary to rotate and be expelled. So just another thing to think about when you're choosing pessary types. So there are so many choices when it comes to pessaries. Um, when we think about a ring and a ring with support pessary, these are typically for less advanced prolapse stages, as I mentioned previously. These are flexible to allow the patient to fold the device in half during insertion. Um, however, it cannot be folded while inside the vagina. And interestingly, if you look at the ring with support or ring pessary, there's a little word press on the sides of the pessary that the patient can look for when they're inserting it to make it easier to fold the pessary and insert it comfortably. I thought that was really interesting. And even after about three and a half years of practice, I didn't even know that existed until a patient showed me during her pessary check, which was kind of funny. Removal, cleaning, and reinsertion is preferably every week, but it can be extended to every couple of weeks if the patient is high functioning, pretty independent, and has appropriate awareness of her body and potential warning signs. And the device must be removed prior to intercourse. Um, this can sometimes take the spontaneity out of being intimate with her partner. So it should just be a discussion that you have with the patient at the time of your pessary fitting with her. And she can decide if she's okay with this or if, again, it's not really something that she thinks would support her quality of life. The Gellhorn pessary is for more advanced stages of prolapse. It has a strong suction at the base of the device that keeps the prolapse suspended. And these typically require the aid of a tenaculum in the office to remove. So it's not something that a patient can typically remove on her own at home and reinsert. Removal, cleaning, and reinsertion of the Gellhorn is typically every three months if the patient is stable and there are no concerns for vaginal erosions from the pessary. And usually with these Gellhorn pessaries, they cannot be used in patients who want to be sexually active for the fact that the patient can't really remove it on her own at home. So again, just something to discuss with your patients. Important to know that both pessary types, when you fit a patient, should have one finger breadth palpable around the pessary edge. This is to ensure that the pessary is snug enough so that it stays in place but not too tight to cause for concern for erosions or excoriations. So the donut and cube pessaries are a little less commonly used in my practice specifically. The donut pessary stays in place, but it requires a little bit more maintenance in terms of removal. And typically you use a large syringe and a needle to deflate the device before removing it. And then it must be reinflated uh, re once it's inserted again after you clean it. And providers should take caution when doing this so as to not injure the surrounding vaginal walls with the needle that they're using to deflate and inflate the pessary. A cube pessary is used in patients who do not tolerate or retain a donut or a gellhorn pessary. The strong preference is that patients remove this daily, which can sometimes be a little too much maintenance for them. So just something to discuss with them when you are choosing. And strong suction from the pessary can at times cause risk for damaging vaginal tissue and creating a lot of discharge. So this is just a good reason for pause when you're seeing a patient with significant atrophy and you're trying to choose a pessary that is most appropriate for them. And if a pessary selection is extremely limited and the cube is the only option and the patient is not able to remove it every day, 
then you want to use a passerine with drainage holes to allow for airflow and that discharge from the vagina can drain from the vagina essentially. But the patient should still be followed closely for removal and an exam and reinsertion to just be vigilant of those um, erosions that she, she may be at risk for. So moving on to insertion and removal, the non-dominant hand is used to separate the labia, gently open the introitus, and depress the perineal body. The dominant hand then inserts the pessary into the vagina. A non-lubricated glove is used, and a small amount of lubricant is applied to the leading edge of the pessary. If too much lubricant is used, the pessary will be too slippery to control. The clinician should be able to fit a finger between the pessary and the vaginal sidewalls. And if the vaginal sidewalls are under excessive pressure, then that's when erosions can result. So it's really important that you take that, that extra small step to just feel around the pessary and make sure that it is the appropriate fit. In my practice, I typically insert the pessary I feel will be the best fit, then have the patient make sure it is comfortable during sitting, standing, and briefly walking around the exam room. I tell patients that it is normal to feel the pessary initially and that this may or may not resolve, but it should never be painful. Next, I will have the patient go to the bathroom where she voids to ensure she's able to empty her bladder. And I instruct her to Valsalva while sitting on the toilet to make sure the pessary is not expelled. They do not have to necessarily void in order to go home with the pessary and they don't have to strain during Valsalva. It's more important to ensure that they can void if they feel that their bladder is full and that they can apply some level of pressure onto the pelvis which, without the pessary being expelled. Make sure you place a urine hat into the toilet before instructing the patient to do these things so that you're not fishing the pessary out if it does become expelled while they're in the bathroom. And in terms of removal, this is patient versus provider removal discussion that you have with the patient and really depends on the pessary type as we reviewed earlier. The frequency of removal also varies as was discussed. Um, and the removal portion of using a pessary or managing a pessary, that can be done either in a standing or a lying position and is really just patient preference. Some patients prefer to stand up, they think it's easier and others prefer to lie down and either of those are fine. The pessary should be cleaned with each removal prior to reinsertion with mild soap and water. You wanna soak it for five minutes and scrub for a minimum of 15 seconds, then rinse thoroughly and reinsert the device. So now we're going to show you a video that nicely demonstrates insertion and removal of a ring pessary. Fold the pessary along the axis of the bigger outer holes by bringing the small round holes together. The knob should be at the top of the arch with the arch formed pointing downward. Direct the pessary past the cervix into the posterior fornix. Allow the pessary to open again in the ring shape after passing the introitus. The index finger is inserted deep into the vagina to turn the pessary approximately 90 degrees so that the knob is resting behind the symphysis pubis. For ring folding pessaries without knob, it's unnecessary to rotate 90 degrees during insertion and removal you should be able to sweep one finger between the pessary and vaginal walls. If the fit is too tight, try the next smaller size pessary as it may cause patient discomfort. If the pessary is too loose, it will not be effective, may rotate or even be expelled. Have the patient sit, stand and bear down. Examine your patient while she is standing to make sure the pessary has not shifted position. She should not feel the pessary once it is in the correct position. To remove the pessary, use one finger to depress the perineum. Turn the pessary until the notches face the introitus. Fold the pessary and gently ease it out. Next, we're going to show a video that demonstrates insertion and removal of a Gellhorn pessary. Use one finger to depress the perineum. Guide the pessary, inserting it edgewise almost vertically to the introitus, avoiding the urethral opening while the perineum is strongly pushed downward. Use a corkscrew motion while introducing the gellhorn into the vagina. 
Once the large flat disc is past the introitus, push the pessary upward until only the end of the stem shows in the vaginal entrance. The cervix rests behind the flat disc. You should be able to sweep one finger between the pessary and vaginal walls. If the fit is too tight, try the next smaller size pessary as it may cause patient discomfort. If the pessary is too loose, it will not be effective, may rotate or even be expelled. Have the patient sit, stand and bear down. Examine your patient while she is standing to make sure the pessary has not shifted position. She should not feel the pessary once it is in the correct position. To remove the pessary, use one finger to depress the perineum. Use the other hand to grasp the knob, pulling the pessary away from the cervix, turning the pessary so that the disc is almost vertical to the introitus. Pessary removal may be facilitated by passing a finger along the stem and behind the disc and folding in against the stem for removal. Using a corkscrew motion, ease the pessary out. Let's move on to tips and tricks in terms of managing a pessary for patients. As I've mentioned earlier in this presentation, pessary management can vary from clinician to clinician. Generally speaking, patients should return on a regular basis for follow-up after being sent home with a pessary. Typically, patients will return soon after their fitting, usually around two to three weeks, to ensure that the pessary is the right fit and is helping with their symptoms. After that, it can range anywhere from every three to six months. At each visit, you should confirm that the pessary is comfortable to the patient and inquire about their bladder and bowel function. You should also check placement, remove the pessary, and clean it for the patient, and perform a pelvic exam to check for any abnormal discharge, bleeding, excoriations, or ulcerations in the vagina. At this point, you then either reinsert the same pessary, adjust the size if needed, or recommend a pessary holiday. Keep in mind that the pessary is a tool that can require some trial and error, even after a patient has been fitted with her original device. And I kind of mentioned this already during my shoe fitting analogy. Sometimes you have to adjust the size or type depending on the, how the patient feels and how she progresses through her course of using the pessary. And sometimes prolapse can still become more extensive over time and that type of pessary may also need to be changed. Patient education is just as important in terms of pessary management for those that have prolapse. We've already touched on the first few of these points in earlier slides, but I want to expand a bit on the remaining education points listed here. You've heard me talk about the quality of life component of prolapse and how that can be improved with pessary use. And I think it's important to discuss this with your patients who choose to fit a pessary as well as what outcomes we expect from pessary use itself. I always counsel my patients that a pessary is not a permanent fix to their prolapse. If they remove the device, chances are their prolapse is going to come back and descend down in the vagina, and they will have the same prolapse symptoms they had before prior to using a pessary. But that is okay if they are happy and it's working well for them. It's also okay for patients to use the pessary on an as-needed basis, as I briefly mentioned. Those who have mild to moderate prolapse or really only want to use it for certain activities that they participate in that would otherwise exacerbate their prolapse or preclude them from being able to participate in those activities that are important to them. Again, this could be during long hikes, playing tennis, golfing, caring for their spouse, running around with their grandkids, anything like that. Some expected outcomes of pessary use include vaginal discharge, spotting, and changes in bladder and um, bowel habits. It's important to discuss with patients that an increase in vaginal discharge and occasional spotting, mostly with removal of the device, do happen at times. Discharge that's consistent with a yeast infection and vaginal bleeding that is heavy are not normal, and these would warrant a phone call to the office so that the patient can be evaluated. 
Some patients feel that they empty their bladder more frequently, and many times they feel that they emptied their bladder better than they did before they had the pessary inserted. If they're unable to empty when they feel full, they need to notify the provider right away and be brought in for an exam to ensure the pessary is not occluding the urethra and putting the patient at risk for urinary retention. Though this is uncommon in my practice, and I encourage you to not let the very low risk scare you away from having your patient try a pessary. Moving on to adjuncts to pessary use, First, pH lowering gel or low dose vaginal estrogen can be used if a patient has discharge, odor, bleeding, and erosions inside the vagina. Lidocaine gel that's applied to the introitus just a couple of minutes prior to insertion can minimize discomfort during removal and reinsertion of the device. So pessary warning signs can include abnormal vaginal discharge, vaginal bleeding, worsening constipation, incomplete bladder, bladder emptying or difficulty voiding, and lastly, pain. So now we're going to do some case studies um, with differing patients who use pessaries in the office and how to potentially manage these patients who have a little more complex cases than your straightforward pessary patient. Our first patient is a 69-year-old G3P3 female who presents to the office with complaints of a bulge in the vagina. She has developed late onset rapid cognitive decline in the past 12 months, unfortunately. So she's a very poor historian. She has a lot of difficulty answering questions and she's accompanied to this visit, this initial visit, by her son, who provides medical history and her history, but his knowledge is also limited. She lives with her husband at home, who is also in declining health and is unable to care for the patient. So when you do your exam, you find that she has a stage three slash stage four cystocele, a stage three to four cervical prolapse, and a stage one rectocele. So we've got a trifecta going on here that we need to figure out how to get her more comfortable. Things to think about when you're making a plan for this patient is that she's, you know, if she were seeing a physician in the office who typically performs surgery, the first thought is she's not a good candidate for surgery due to her rapid cognitive decline. And so likely she's going to land in your office as the APP for a potential passery fitting. In the office, she was fitted with a number four ring with support, and she's not really a good candidate for self-removal either. So the decision was made to return every three months for removal, cleaning, and to reinsert the passery. The next case is a patient with a um, myelodysplastic syndrome. So this is a 79-year-old who was previously established with an outside provider and is transferring her care to your clinic after her long-term provider retired. Her exam findings show a stage two cystocele, a stage two rectocele, and a stage one cervical prolapse. A number five ring with support was found on exam to be seated appropriately in the vagina. However, with removal and an exam of the vagina with the speculum, multiple erosions and abrasions and granulation tissue were present. So how do we get this patient back on track? Because she's really happy with her pessary. She doesn't want to give it up, but she has these erosions and granulation tissue that are putting her you know, at risk for other problems. So again, things to think about would be that she's not a good surgical candidate. Um, so the pessary is probably, again, the preference for managing her prolapse. And another thing to think about is that she's undergoing treatment for myelodysplastic syndrome. So her immune system isn't the most robust when you're thinking about surgery and recovery. The patient is also resistant to a pessary holiday because again, she's very happy with her device and she doesn't like the prolapse symptoms that she senses when the pessary is out. So she has a very strong past preference to keep the pessary in despite the erosions and the granulation tissue. So her pessary size was decreased with still a good fit and that one finger breadth 
not too much space around the edge, that we felt that the pessary would stay inside the vagina, it would not be expelled, and we could give this a try. The patient was instructed to follow up in three months for her next pessary check, and we reviewed warning signs in detail with the patient so that she knew when to call the office if she had problems. So the patient comes back for her follow-up visit, and she subsequently, after several follow-up visits, in fact, has these persistent vaginal erosions and abrasions in the vagina. Her pessary was downsized again to number three and then number two at subsequent visits because she essentially declined to have the pessary out for a holiday, as, as previously mentioned. And we wanted to follow up more closely with her in the office. So at this point, when a patient comes back, you're downsizing their pessary, they have these erosions and excoriations, and they're really resistant to taking a break. You need to think about having them come in more frequently so you can keep a close eye on them. And eventually she did agree to a short course pessary holiday where she took a break, knowing that she might feel those prolapse symptoms um, but that it is important to kind of let her vaginal tissue recover. Long-term, she tolerated a size two um, ring with support and still achieved improvement in her voiding and bowel movements. So she had a good outcome, despite a little bit more of a challenging um, management plan for her. Next, we're going to talk about um, another patient who is an elderly woman in a group home. So this is a 105-year-old woman um, who has no family support. She lives in a skilled nursing facility. She does have some mobility limitations and most re recently, unfortunately, has required wheelchair assistance to get around. She's unable to remove and reinsert the pessary on her own, and she's not able to um, apply any vaginal creams. She's not a good surgical candidate due to her age, and she has some other comorbidities that would preclude her from a surgical repair. So on exam, the patient has complete uterovaginal prolapse, or that complete prosedentia that we had mentioned earlier. And she also elicits stress urinary incontinence and occasional loose stools. The plan that was made for her was that she was fitted with a two-inch Gellhorn pessary, she reported it was comfortable in the office and she was able to avoid without issue. Her follow-up was initially that two to three weeks after her fitting to ensure it's the proper fit, and then every three months after that. This is a 46-year-old G4P3. She's married, she's sexually active with her partner, and she notes an increase in pelvic pressure and stress urinary incontinence since the birth of her last child. With coughing and exercising, her incontinence seems to be worse, which is really bothersome to her. And her exam findings essentially show mild prolapse. So this patient was fitted with a number three ring pessary with support and knob. Her initial follow-up was two to three weeks after her um, first insertion and fitting. And then she came back every six months after that, after being taught how to remove and clean and reinsert the pessary on her own. She reported improvement in her symptoms and felt very comfortable managing the pessary on her own, hence the last frequent follow-ups for her specifically. So in closing, some key takeaways are that a pessary is a really great option for patients um, that doesn't involve surgery, that is first-line therapy for a lot of clinicians, and shows to nearly resolve all prolapse symptoms, which is really meaningful for patients. They're inexpensive, um, they're removable, and they allow for immediate correction or resolve of symptoms. Trial and error is common in these devices, which the provider should keep in mind. And lastly, it's important to provide patient education at that first fitting and throughout follow-up visits. Thank you, Natalie, for uh, doing that such a great presentation. And now we're going to move on to our question and answer portion. All right. Um, so that was great. And um, throughout the presentation, we had a few questions come in. And we're going to go ahead and start with those. The first question is, um, what are the general recommendations um, to follow up 
after someone's had a, a pest reinserted for the first time? Sure. So recommended it is to follow up um, in 24 hours for the first exam after a pessary is fitted, and then about three days after that for a second exam. Okay. Of course, this schedule may need to be altered depending on the individual patient's needs and their availability to come back for that appointment. And it's at the discretion of the provider as well. Yeah. Um, and you see that a lot. That's, you know, that in general, it's between the provider and the patient, but in general, those are definitely what's recommended. Um, the next question um, came up, was from someone just asking about if they have a pessary in, can they go through an x-ray or an MRI? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so most pessaries can go through an x-ray or an MRI. However, with the larger sizes, such as the 11 to 13 ring pessaries, um, these actually contain a wire coil inside. So they will need to be removed prior to an x-ray or an MRI. But of course, we always recommend that you read the insert in the actual product for instructions in case there's anything else that's specific to that type of pessary. Okay, great, great. Um, the Another question was, if my patient's uh, taking it out and cleaning at home, what's recommended for them to, to use to uh, clean the pessary? So generally it's recommended to use mild soap such as Dawn or an equivalent um, and tap water. And you want the patient to soak it in the solution for at least five minutes, it can be a little bit longer if they want to. And then they're going to want to scrub it for 15 seconds rinse thoroughly, and then dry the pessary. Okay. Um, and this last question, um, I don't mind to take, it was a question that came through. Um, as far as this presentation, would they be able to see it again? And actually you can, um, you, you won't be able to download it necessarily, but you'll be able to see this on uh, cooperinsights.com and also on the AUGS uh, YouTube's uh, website. So you can um, view this this presentation again on those sites. So, um, and I think we're done. So uh, thank you, more. Natalie. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, Mindy, a couple more questions came in actually in the Q and A box just now. Okay. okay, let me take a look here. Just now I'm trying to find them. Let me go back on that website, bear me. Oh, I can read okay. it out. You see it? I got it. I got it. Yeah. So, um, okay. So if someone does not feel comfortable using estrogen cream, what would you recommend for estrogen delivery? That's a great question. I think that that really depends on the provider's preference um, and what the risks are in terms of estrogen forms for that patient. So I would just recommend discussing that with the, the providers that you work with and what their typical practice is, just because it varies so greatly from um, provider to provider. Okay, and then uh, the last question is, do you have any personal tricks on how to remove a cube press pessary? Yeah, so those are a little trickier and they're not as commonly used in some practices. So in my practice, I don't use them very often. Um, but they are really helpful in some patients that have more extensive prolapse and, you know, something like a Gellhorn just doesn't work that well for them. Okay. Removing the cube pessary, I usually recommend still, um, releasing that suction that is between the, the pessary and the prolapse that can be really helpful. Um, and sometimes you can have the patient bear down a little bit to help with that. Um, and also just like if, like you had mentioned, those instructions for use usually accompany um, every one of your pessaries. So, you know, no matter what, where, what company has them, they should have a fold out, a folding um, instructions for use. So it's always good to check those because typically they're going to have some instructions on there. Um, and also look at the company's website. They might have, you know, some tips and tricks or some useful education materials on their website. So. Okay. Yes. Agree. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, I don't see any more questions again. Um, feel free to, you know, take a look at this again. And, you know, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to us.
So thank you, everyone.